What's going on, you bewilderingly bloated budgery guys? Welcome to this week's episode of Total Pod Mode. My name is James, also known as Mr. Bames, and I'm joined, as always, by the wondrous Will, also known as Hoodafunk. What's up, James? Good to see you, buddy, and welcome, listeners, to episode 46 of Total Pod Mode. Yes, an exciting episode it is. We've got the catch-up, we've got some news talking about releases, potential releases, delayed releases, brought forward releases, all sorts of crazy release news, and finally finishing off with Completionist Corner, where, once again, we dip into a new game, a spy game. Ooh, spoilery. Nah, I won't say it now. Let me wait. <laughs> the mystery. It's just a spy game. But before all that, let's hit them socials. You can, as always, find the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts by searching for Total Pod Mode. We also post regular video content of our playthroughs, stream highlights, as well as the podcast on our YouTube channel, Total Pod Mode. You can also find us on Twitter by searching for at Total Pod Mode, all one word. Or you can find me at Hoodafunk on Twitter, and I'm also on Twitch under twitch.tv forward slash Hoodafunk. And you can find me on Twitter at Mr. Bames, and I'm also on Twitch under twitch.tv forward slash Mr. Bames underscore TPM. So Will, talk to me man, I know you've had a bit of time this week, what have you been up to, what have you been playing? So this week I delved once again back into the world of Call of Duty, I got distracted from my other duties and uh, knit back in to see what Season 4 was saying. I was honestly convinced, and I had thoroughly convinced myself, that I wasn't actually going to invest in the Season 4 Battle Pass. However, looking at my COD balance at the end, it turned out that I actually did have enough coins left over to just purchase it without having to actually spend any money. More on that later. So as I just said there, I did actually indulge myself there and have begun to unlock various new things in the Battle Pass. I've been doing a lot more exploring of the Vondel place that we talked about earlier, which is kind of set within the streets of Amsterdam alongside various uh, kind of tourist locations like the Central Station. You've also got playground environments like a football pitch, a, a giant chess board that you can run across and various other kind of tourist attractions. And it's a really built up area and is really fun for exploring as well as shooting people. A lot of the missions you can pick up in the DMZ modes have been really fun where you need to collect an object such as computer evidence from a laptop, take it to another location, drop it off and replace it with fake evidence. And a lot of these missions go towards earning you various different weapons, the contraband weapons, as well as earning you experience with the faction to unlocking more difficult missions and enabling you to get upgrades like increased inventory space, increased insured weapon slots so you can carry more guns into the battlefield that you can customise. And a new feature that seems to have been added is there's actually a wallet outside the battlefield now which has a capacity on it. And every time you extract money, not only does it contribute towards your experience gained and your weapon cooldown on the next round if you've lost one of your insured weapons, but the money will also now go into your wallet. I think by default you can hold up to a hundred grand and then that means that whenever you want to go back into the battlefield even if you are killed and have lost all of your money that's on your player you can dip into the wallet and take a load of money with you into your next run and that means that you can then do things like buy kill streaks, buy custom weapons, buy improved gear as well. So you're not at such a disadvantage when you get killed. You don't lose everything. You can always rely on your wallet. I oh, you see. I thought you were going to be like saying that um, the money in your wallet contributes to your COD points and that's how you were able to buy your battle pass. And I was going to be really impressed. Um, and because I built that up in my head, that's not so impressive to me. <laughs> <Sadly>. <laughs> yeah, I think your expectations were probably set a little high there. This is much more just based around the DMZ mode itself and the benefit of being able to have quick access to funds, which is a great improvement from my side of things. Really happy to see that put into the game. And they've worked in various ways that you can upgrade your wallet via collecting different items around the game. It means that a lot of the miscellaneous objects, like med packs, as well as data sticks and hard drives, a lot of those were fairly pointless items to be collecting before, unless you were intending on selling them or collecting them for a specific mission. So those items now have various side uses so that you can actually use them to afford yourself upgrades. Very nice. All in all, the game is really building itself up and it's slowly working its way to more and more Tarkov territory. I've even noticed things like you can actually steal GPUs from computers and they're one of the high value items that you can extract in the game. Makes sense. And the new weapons crates, which is some of the harder items to get in each of the map locations, in Vondel is now located on the back of a heavily armoured truck that you need to drive around attack with rocket launchers and mines and whatever else you have whilst dodging the mines and it keeps on deploying from behind it 
eventually you're able to destroy the truck and retrieve the weapons case and then as always you need to hop on a helicopter and get the hell out of there so they're just adding more loot to sort of play with more sort of not quite set pieces, but kind of set pieces to get the loot from. Yeah, more interesting diversions in the way that they manage it. I mean, they've put it on the back of trains that you need to sustain attacks from helicopters. They've now put it on a vehicle that has mines. They've had it in heavily guarded fortresses. So they're really playing with how they can hide away these crates and make them difficult to access. And it is really satisfying figuring out a battle plan and how you're going to go in and successfully do that. Awesome. So another note about this season is that they actually have various missions. A lot of them are community level events where you earn these purple medals. Each of the purple medals goes towards a collective community balance, and once that balance accumulates enough at different tiers, you unlock different things. Some of these things are basic features like a roaming buy station on Vondel. So once the community has hit that amount, it will now unlock a traveling buy station that uses the canals in Vondel to get around. You can also unlock really useful weapon crates in the game that now appear on the map because everyone's unlocked enough points. They're called favorite crates, and those are used to automatically deploy weapons that you have selected as your favorite loadout class. So if you've had the foresight to go in, create a class, and then mark that class as your favorite class, it will be a guaranteed drop that whenever you open that crate, you get both of those weapons included. That's pretty neat. Yeah, they're adding in all sorts of little fun features like that that make it very easy to suddenly score a good load of your own weapons. Is that not in danger of removing the challenge? Or I'm playing devil's advocate, or is it just purely more fun? I think it is probably just more fun, really. They've added in so many different ways now that you can upgrade a weapon, even if you pick a weapon up off the floor for as little as a couple thousand dollars. And speaking in relative terms, a high value item will sell for ten thousand dollars. In this game, you can actually afford yourself weapon attachments for your gun. So you can take a gun that you found on the floor with no attachments whatsoever and upgrade it with very little money. Uh, so really they're just kind of giving you additional options as opposed to making any certain option too overpowered. Okay. The final tier unlock for the community challenge is unlocking the Tonfa weapon, which uh, for people that aren't aware looks a lot like a police baton. Yeah, that's exactly right. Sorry, that was really bad podcasting. I was miming what a Tonfa looks like and you were swinging <laughs> it. And might I say, it was absolutely spot on. Majestic, majestic. Beautiful form there, I will say. Just f***ing flailing my arms around. Why are you the way that you are? So I'm looking forward to running around the battlefield, swatting people with my tonfa at some point. The last time I checked it, there were only a couple hundred thousand purple medals away from unlocking that. So I think that we'll be there pretty quickly. A couple hundred thousand sounds like a lot. Yeah, it's Call of Duty though, man. Think about the amount of people that are playing and unlocking these things. There's absolutely loads. And these medals can be unlocked for things as simple as finding a detonator item in each of the different main areas of the map, or killing 10 enemies, or killing a commander, or blowing up a certain amount of vehicles. So they're all things that are very easy to uh, to do, even by accident, a lot of the time. I think I've accumulated about 30 or 40 now, the majority of them being purely by chance that I've just been wandering around for. Oh, there's that detonator I needed to find. Go pick that up. So yeah, as you can imagine, they come very easily. And uh, with the amount of people playing, those numbers just stack up. It's almost like by the time you started playing and stopped, you can see a visible difference in the progress bar. Very nice. So getting back into the battle pass side of things, I do have an admission to make. I did actually end up going around and buying the premium battle pass in the end as well. I couldn't resist. I've got a lot of time for this game at the moment, so I was happy to spend out some money. <laughs> I do have a question for you, though. Yeah, go for it. What happened to Diablo being your new COD? They haven't released the battle pass yet, man. That's what it is. Yeah, but you've already got it. That's the thing, you're buying COD content when you've got a battle pass coming. <laughs> hey man, more on Diablo later. Yeah, you're going to be run off your feet, bud. <laughs> I'm actually something like 65% through this battle pass already, so we're putting in good work. We've got 30 days remaining. I'm not going with the absolute goal of completing this one. However, you do unlock some really cool stuff with it. I've got now, uh, by really cool, I mean <laughs> really cool if you're invested in the world of Call of Duty. I've got like a very nice purple ankle flare now when i parachute in and my parachute changes color between kind of a black and black and white type look it's very fancy very eye catching i can't judge you because i've been <laughs> caught out by this shit before as well but yeah when when you say it from someone because i'm have no interest in cod right when you say it from someone on the outside i'm just like god damn dude how much you spend 20 quid it was 20 quid for the uh premium edition of it yeah yeah but I spend way more than 20 hours in each of these battle passes. So I see it as fairly good That's value for money. That's always anyway. how I justify it as well, yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, so what if I spend 20 quid on this free game? Uh, I've put my 20 quid's worth of fun out of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got all sorts of crazy skins now, and I like to flex them. I mean, I've got the Easter Bunny, which is uh, a very nice skin there. I've got kind of a, a, a guy with fox ears. So so furry. So you're just being a furry, basically. Yeah, I've, yeah. There's, there's, there's furry elements to that one. I won't deny it. Absolutely. And I've got a gun that turns people into golden shattering statues when you kill them. So, I mean, I, I can't well, complain, kind of honestly. <laughs> it's starting to feel less and less like Call of Duty and more like an insane game at this point, but I'm loving it. So what you're telling me is Call of Duty has become Saints Row. In a way, there is occasional Saints Row flavors going in there, perhaps less bombastic or outrageous as Saints Row, but it's definitely getting to that point. I think in the last one, you could even be Snoop Dogg running around, complete with fully voiced dialogue and everything. I don't know. You've, you've Everything you told me just there is Saints Row. Purple ankle flare for your parachute guy. Yeah, Saints yeah. Row. Guys dressed up in animal costumes. That's, uh, <laughs> that's Saints Row again. A gun that turns people into golden statues before shooting them. It's not in Saints Row, but I'd believe you if you told me it was in Saints Row. <laughs> just saying. Still no shotgun pim cane, unfortunately, but we can always ah, dream. What's the point then? So I think that's pretty much all the updates I've got for Call of Duty. So as I mentioned earlier, let's get on to a little bit of Diablo. So I suppose there's not much in the way of new news for Diablo 4. I've just been progressing through as my barbarian character. I think I finally breached level 30 last night. I think we're sitting on level 33 at the moment. I'm somewhere in the early stages of Act 2, but I've been preoccupying myself with a lot of side quest type missions as well. I'd advise against that. <laughs> oh, why's that? Get through the campaign as quickly as possible. The side quests will level up to you when you get into the new realm. You'll get better loot from it. It's just oh efficiency. fine okay just okay. get th get through the campaign. I made that mistake too, bro. I like, I I got to like level fifty before I'd done Act Two. <laughs> if I'm doing side content and stuff, that's not true, but quite high up. Do the side quests refresh themselves when you go back into New Game Plus? You don't go into New Game Plus. You just change world tier, so you've got exactly the same quests unlocked. All of your progress is exactly the same. It just ups the level and ups the rewards. That's all. Fine. So okay. just bosh through the campaign as quickly as possible. Get to world tier three at least, and then you can use the side quests to level you up for world tier four. That would be my advice. Okay. Yeah, no, I think but you're I right. I didn't there. actually do that myself. <laughs> it sounds like we've switched round in approaches because my initial approach was just to smash through the campaign and get to end game as early as possible. And then I've kind of looked around now on all these glowing blue side quest outlines keep on popping up on my map and they bother me. So I decided to do a handful of them last night. Yeah. I got myself leveled up, but with that knowledge that you've just given me there, it definitely sounds like the better thing to do is just wait till those level tiers are pumped. Better world tiers, better loot seems to be my main impression. Whenever I've switched it up a gear, you get better stuff, or at least more frequent drops of the good stuff. It depends what your goal with the game is, right? Become all-powerful. Well, you see, if your goal is to become all-powerful, bosh through the campaign as quickly as possible. Honestly, that would be my recommendation. If your goal is to just enjoy a nice little RPG, do what you want. I went for the the sort of combo approach. I did the first three acts, 100%ing every single... Well, not 100%, but doing as much as I could be asked to do in each area before moving on to the next. Yeah. And I would recommend against doing that. Which is odd for me to say. It is, yeah. I'm struggling to believe that you're saying this to me right now. But uh, yeah, no, fair play. I think it may be the first game that you've ever recommended that you just ignore all side content and push through. And it's a method that I often recommend to you myself, actually. <laughs> both George and I both made the same mistake with Diablo in that we tried to do side content as well as the main quest. And it's just like, it's great fun. You'll have a great time doing it. But leave some side content for when you'll get a bit bored of the grind in the next world tier and you want to just have a break. Just be like, okay, we'll do some side quests now. That sounds like a very good point. I'm going to heed that and maybe just complete one or two if they're in my immediate vicinity. But if they're ever out of my path, I'm no longer going to go out of my way to complete them. Yeah, the other thing to bear in mind is you can only have 20 active at a time. Oh, is that true? I wasn't aware of that. Okay, okay, that's also useful to know. As you say, do them if they're right next to you but campaign i'm gonna yes yeah note taken for sure i'm gonna i'm gonna stop picking up random side and, and you know it's real advice when i'm telling you that because <laughs> yeah. i i am the completionist i will do i've ruined games for myself by not focusing on the main quest before there's probably so many games that you could have completed if you just heeded your advice that you gave me five minutes oh, ago yeah <laughs> oh, so many. Are you kidding me? I'd have finished loads of games. I'd have finished Assassin's Creed Odyssey if I'd done that. Yeah. Instead of spending 100 hours doing f***ing side content. 
So I'm settling into a pretty good swing at the moment with Diablo. I'm using a mixture of my regular basic attack, which allows me to lunge across, as well as my whirlwind attack. Using a good combination of the grappling hooks to pull enemies in, and then truly unleashing the whirlwind attack. And I've also been making good use of the kick ability, which I really like, where you can kind of do a combination of you can yank enemies in towards you, kick them and send them flying away, and if they bump into an object they become stunned and they take extra damage. And you can kind of get into a sort of push and pull type situation where you're just repeatedly stunning them, grappling them. Very nice. Yeah, I'm finding that type of combat really interesting. I think, as I mentioned before, it's a much more interesting way of fighting than it was in Diablo 3, which could feel very monotonous at times. This really does kind of keep you on your feet. And the other ability that I've been using, I can't remember what it's called, but it gives you essentially a shield for 50% upgradable to 20% of your health at the time. Oh, is that fortitude? Because I think that's what my druid has. It like put, it almost puts an overlay on your health bar that's like a brighter red, and that goes down before your health goes down. It sounds like a very similar thing, but different. Mine's kind of like a blue overlay over the red health bar. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's probably a very similar thing to how uh, Fury and the Druid's power works as well. Or it's Barrier, like my mage has, that puts a blue bit over. They're all the same thing. Basically. Yeah, it's some sort of shout or something for the Barbarian, but it does the exact same thing. It creates a barrier. Yeah. Got it, yeah. But other than that, man, it's been pretty plain sailing through Diablo 4, still having a really good time with that. And other than that, not really much more news from me. What about yourself? Uh, short and sweet, mate. Absolutely nothing. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've not played anything this week at all. Haven't had any energy. <laughs> Fair enough. So I've, so I've only, so I've only done uh, the spy game, the mystery spy game. So no, sorry, very boring. But um, I should have a bit more next week because um, at the time of recording, Wolong's first DLC came out yesterday. Oh, very nice! Something to get yourself back into Wolong again. Uh, yeah, and they've uh, they've added like fifteen new achievements, so it shows that I've got a hundred percent still. But uh, <laughs> you know, you got to push through get those juicy gamer points yeah exactly and obviously steam summer sale started so uh, oh that was a good alliteration so uh, i'll probably be picking up about 20 games that i won't play for a few years <laughs> all that hopefully to look forward to next week but in the meantime let's go talk about some news <laughs> So in our first news story this week, Niantic, the developers of Pokemon Go, have announced the closure of their Los Angeles studio. Not only is this bad news for the 230 or so employees who will be losing their jobs, but it also has had a direct impact on some of their upcoming releases. Two games have been cancelled as a result of this, NBA All World and Marvel World of Heroes. Niantic were quick to reassure fans in a blog post that this news would not impact their other titles, including Pokemon Go, Pikmin Bloom, Peridot, Ingress, and the upcoming Monster Hunter Now. The blog also explains that the shutting down of its LA studio is to free up resources to help it prepare for the emergence of MR devices and the future of AR glasses. However, according to an internal article seen by Kotaku, Niantic founder John Hanker explains that the decision came mainly due to the fact that Expenses grew faster than revenue this year, pointing to a surge in revenue during the COVID-19 pandemic as a most likely cause. So interesting times ahead at Niantic here. It's a bit of an odd one to have four or five games on the go that then close a studio down that could have helped out with the development and or support of those. It's a bit of an odd move this for me. What do you think? To me, it sounds like they were kind of counting themselves as having more money than they would likely have and they got over ambitious and now need to close down some projects to focus resources and it's interesting that a marvel title got dropped as a result of that i'm not a, a huge follower of basketball or the nba series myself although i know that you've played quite a few of the games in the past yeah presumably this is a mobile game though because that's kind of the antics bag isn't it so yeah. i'm just not aware of the sort of the wider appeal of that if you think that that would draw in as much interest as marvel would but it's interesting that pikmin made the cut over marvel for instance although i know that that is a very large title as well ingress is already an established title and was the prior title to pokemon go so it makes sense that they're doing well to honor that monster hunter yeah, but be bear in mind just quickly on those that the nba and marvel games aren't out the, all the other ones are so they're all current 
buying games rights. that they're not going to okay, stop yeah. supporting. If so, whereas yeah. those ones are currently in development, I believe so at least. Yeah, because it does say the upcoming Monster Hunter now. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But presumably that's too big to fail, right? I'll be interested to see what that looks like. Honestly, <laughs> if it's Pokemon Go, but I get to like chuck weapons at monsters out in the wild, then I'm all for it. Honestly, if I just get to pull out my hunter bow and walk down the road chasing after a goddamn Nergigante, then so be it. I'm all for that. It's probably more likely to be like the gym battles in Pokemon Go, which are awful, so... Just tapping your screen, mate. Matching the screen, screen. yeah. And occasionally hitting a special. Yeah, not respecting the rules of Pokemon. Unbelievable. Did you know that normal moves can hit ghost types in f***ing Pokemon Go? It just comes up as not very effective. Shouldn't hit them at all. (laughs) So, yeah, I've no time for that. But yeah, I thought this was interesting because Niantic are um, a fairly big deal just purely on the basis of Pokemon Go. So it's surprising to me that they are seemingly having money problems at the moment. But hey, who knows? Can happen to everyone, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, especially if you buy off more than you can chew in terms of projects during a surge of income. Moving on to our second news story of the day, and one particularly of interest to Will here, I believe, but voice actor Luke Roberts, who will play James Sunderland in the Silent Hill 2 remake, has seemingly hinted at the long-awaited title's release date. Another voice actor giving away trade secrets there. (laughs) (laughs) Releasing information on the game. I'm looking at you, Norman Reedus. Yeah, well, pinch of salt. The news comes from the video game forum Reset Era, where a user allegedly messaged Roberts on Instagram asking when Silent Hill 2 was set to be released. Roberts' response was a short but sweet, early next year, I believe. Do you think at this point that that Instagram user honestly expected an answer back, a legitimate answer from the voice actor? Or do you think they were just fishing? Or do you think that they were just asking it knowing that they wouldn't get a serious reply? Probably just chance in their arm, to be yeah. perfectly honest with you. <laughs> hey, he might be having a good day. He might just tell me the release date for an upcoming massively anticipated title. Stranger things have happened, right? <laughs> honestly, I'm willing to believe this. Well, interestingly, there was a screenshot in the article, which I didn't link on here, but it's actually a screenshot of the direct message. So, oh, is there? Okay, yeah. The fact that he sent the message is legit. Whether it's true or not remains to be seen. Yeah, I think that's the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, this may be disappointing for fans who were hopeful of release this year. However, the news does make sense as Blue Bra yet to begin any sort of major marketing push for the game. Which, if it was going to come out this year, for example, they'd probably have started doing that by now. So, this is still very much speculation at this stage, but you'd think the voice actor for the main character would have a fairly good idea of the timeline surrounding release. The question is, Will, as you've already said there, is do we believe him? I'm tempted to say yes on this one, although I don't know whether it's early next year in terms of that being confirmed, but I think that he would have a good idea of it. I think we're very, very likely to see this next year at some point. However, I think that there's a lot of things that can happen further down the pipeline in production, past voice acting, recording and hiring, that uh, that could throw up some red flags for this game, if in terms of performance that they were having some real issues, I could see this being pushed back. I think that this is definitely a title that they won't want to mess up, though, because following the Capcom series of remakes that have been so successful... I think that for this horror franchise, they're going to really want to make solid work of the first one in the same way that they remade the original Resident Evil 1 all those years ago, and then the Resident Evil 2 remake more recently. If they really hit it out of the park with Silent Hill 2, I think that this could absolutely be a gateway into a complete reboot of the Silent Hill franchise alongside the remakes of all the previous games as well which is kind of the route the Capcom's taken with Resident Evil. And Silent Hill is actually probably my more preferred of those two franchises. So I think that that could potentially be something that I'm really looking forward to, depending on how they handle this one. Yeah, which given your glowing review of the first lot of remakes they did, yet to be seen. Yeah, that HD collection was a bit of a mess. But again, not representative of uh, of an actual true attempt at a remake either. So it goes, but... Uh... Might be longer than perhaps some people were anticipating waiting, so apologies for that if you were one of the people that thought it was going to come out this year. (laughs) Sucks to be you, man! So continuing with the theme of release dates on our final news story, but something a little bit different this time. So Baldur's Gate 3 has had its PC release date changed, but it's bucking the recent trend by bringing its release date forward rather than pushing it back. So, this game was initially scheduled for release on PC by the 31st of August, but it's been announced that this date will now be the 3rd of August, which is great news for the fans of the franchise who have been chomping at the bit to play this game. So, according to Jason Schreier at Bloomberg, the reason for this is likely so that there is some breathing room between the release of Baldur's Gate 3 and Starfield, which is slated for release on PC on the 6th of September. It all makes sense now. 
if <laughs> right. does make yeah, sense, doesn't yeah. it? Right? <laughs> However, it's not all good news because the PS5 port of Baldur's Gate 3 has in fact been delayed to, funnily enough, the 6th of September. But the reasoning is quite sound, in my opinion, because that delay is so that the team can ensure it releases with 60 FPS support because they didn't want it to come out at 30 FPS when they've been developing it to be 60 this whole time. So that's quite neat. But uh, not particularly good news for Xbox fans when it comes to Baldur's Gate 3, though, as at this time there is still no confirmed release date for the platform, although the Baldur's Gate 3 team are optimistic about getting the game on Xbox. Okay. Basically, PC wins. I mean, I remember a time when uh, Mahoyo Studios were optimistic about getting Genshin Impact on the Switch, and uh, it's been three years, so uh, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. <laughs> Very true, although you'd think that with um, Baldur's Gate's relationship with Microsoft that there might be a little bit of an easier path to entry for Xbox than there might have been for uh, Genshin on the Switch. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yes, that is true. But who knows? Remains to be seen. But quite cool that someone's bucking the trend of all these delayed releases by bringing something forward. And a major title, no less. Is uh, Baldur's Gate 3 a game that particularly tickles your balls? or? Uh... Uh, I respect Baldur's Gate, but I was a Neverwinter Nights boy, so I never played it. Fine. Fine. So it doesn't move the needle for me, but I respect the game and the franchise for sure. There's a reason it's one of, considered one of the uh, the top RPGs of all time, right? Yeah, I'll be interested to see more on release. Maybe I'll have a dabble somewhere down the line. And with that, I think we come to the end of the news for this week. So let's move on to Completionist Corner. Here we go for the Completionist's Corner. So we'll get rid of all the suspense now. All we've said is spy game to this point. This week we have been playing Perfect Dark. So Perfect Dark, a first person spy FPS, was released in the year 2000 for Nintendo 64 and is considered by many as a spiritual successor to the very successful Goldeneye game. Despite having nothing in common with the story of Goldeneye, the mechanical similarities are there to be seen. An excellent pedigree. Both made by Rare, right? So uh, you can definitely see where a lot of the ideas went following Goldeneye. So in this game, we play as Agent Joanna Dark, a sassy and ruthless spy who works for the Carrington Institute, and take her on a journey of conspiracy, extraterrestrials, and shooting. Lots of shooting. Yeah, for a spy game, there's a lot of shooting. <laughs> so our first mission given to us by our handler, Daniel Carrington, is to rescue and extract a scientist from a high-security research area beneath the Datadyne skyscraper, Datadyne being a large research and development type organisation who are one of the main antagonists of the game, but before we get into all that, let's talk about the game a little bit first, just in general. Older game, so slightly different to how a lot of people might be imagining the shooting goes. You can aim and shoot, you can't move while aiming though. You can kind of use it to peek around corners though, can't you? Which is quite useful. Uh, I never did, but I believe you. If I'm being honest, I didn't really use the manual aim all that much because you can't move and you at the same time and the accuracy of a lot of the guns was pretty good without it, to be honest with you. And there's quite a lot of auto-aim and aim assist as well, isn't there? Your cursor kind of gently follows enemies and when you nudge it in the direction of them, it will sort of stay on them. It's not like modern games where your cursor is locked in the centre of your screen at all times. It does follow enemies to a small degree, even when you're not manually aiming. Which has cost me a lot of kills as well, to be honest <laughs> with you. Because it takes it away from where you're aiming sometimes, which is really irritating, particularly on the very final fight of the game. But we'll get into that when we get to it. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And that's one of the things that I wanted to get into. So this game, I've played uh, a mixed versions of this. I've done a little bit of this week playing the Nintendo 64 version, a little bit of this week playing the upgraded version that came with the Rare Replay collection. And I've got to say, the experiences were mostly comparable. However, there were some additional control options that I found in the upgraded version which were very useful. One of which is that I turn the auto-aim off and the other being that the cursor is always centered on the screen. And you can actually muck around with the control scheme. There's two different variants. One of them is called Spartan, which predictably gives you Halo-style controls. And the other control scheme is called... Duty Calls. Duty Calls, exactly that, which gives you Call of Duty controls. So I switched those round and found that a lot more accessible. It still had that certain level of movement in terms of the crosshair, but it wasn't as powerful as it was before. You can adjust the sensitivity quite a bit, which is great. Cool, cool. And at this stage, we may as well, as you've mentioned there, mission difficulty and things like that, we may as well go over the sort of briefly what the mission structures are. So there are three levels of difficulty, agent, super agent, and perfect agent. There's also an unlockable difficulty if you complete all of the missions on perfect agent as well. You get perfect dark. The basic difference to these from the mission standpoint is that 
each level you go up, you essentially get one or two extra tasks to do in the mission, uh, which basically just involves you going around, exploring the map a little bit more, collecting different items, maybe getting some data that you wouldn't get on the normal one. Little things like that. Bunch of spy shit. Just spy shit, yeah. <laughs> the only other difference is that uh, more enemies hit harder, better accuracy, all that good stuff. And they also drop less ammunition as well, which really can ramp up the difficulty there. I think on the easier difficulty, they drop about 30 bullets on average. On the harder difficulty, they drop about 10. So it becomes very restrictive in terms of just how many bullets you're able to use. For sure. I also really like the idea of amping the difficulty by adding additional objectives instead of just making the game harder in terms of how much damage you take. It's quite a cool idea to be able to play through a game again and have additional elements, even though, as we kind of mentioned before, they're not particularly meaningful. It is a really good way to add some extra difficulty to the game. And honestly, I started playing this game on the agent difficulty. And then when I understood that you got at least three or four more missions in certain levels, I thought, you know what, I actually want to go back and start this on the hardest difficulty so I actually see all of the stuff this game has to offer. And I was really pleased I did. The only sort of other thing I thought we should discuss before we get properly into the story is a uh, sort of initial discussion on the weapons because you do get a huge arsenal of weapons in this game. Absolutely massive, yeah. So we'll get into more of them later on because there's, I think, three or four different factions whose weapons you can use in this game. But we're basically, obviously, we start off with Carrington weapons because we work for the Carrington Institute and we will pick up a lot of Datadyne weapons as we go. The sort of PP7 of this game is the Falcon Pistol, which is f***ing awesome. Really like the silenced version of that pistol. It's really powerful, it sounds great, and uh, yeah, it looks great as well. It's a really fun gun to use. And dual wield is just top tier. Um, and Datadyne weapons, I think, encompasses, there's a little Uzi type thing called the C-152. Two zero, I think. I think that's C1590 about right. I think there's a nine in there like somewhere. Yeah, these guns they could have uh, they could have done a little bit better in terms of making them a bit more memorable. They kind of went the route of making them sound legitimate military guns. Apart from the dragon, there are a couple. Yeah, so there's the dragon, which is a, a very cool assault rifle that you can throw like a grenade. That's its secondary fire. We should mention that a lot of the guns have secondary fires in this game, right? No, all of the guns have secondary fire. They do. Well, I mean, if, if you call secondary fire a melee move, it's a punch. It's not really I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, so, so the Falcon Pistol's secondary fire is pistol whip, right? Yeah. But most of the other weapons have something cool. Like a burst fire shot, or as I mentioned there, the one that you can chuck into a grenade. Early on in the first level, you can find the laptop gun, which uh, is, as you imagine there, is a gun that resembles a laptop. It's a deployable turret, and it's secondary fire though so that can be very useful as well and there's some other really cool ones that we won't talk about now because we haven't got to that weapon style yet but uh one of them's a sniper rifle that lets you fire through walls so <laughs> yes that's pretty fucking cool the so. far side very cool <laughs> but no so with all that said let's get into the game so on our mission to rescue and extract a scientist we fight our way through the datadyne building heading down the lower levels where we eventually find dr carol however upon finding dr carol Joanna, the protagonist and main character of the game, is surprised to discover they are an AI created by Datadyne itself, basically resembling a floating laptop with two eyes as a screensaver. Getting over her initial surprise, Joanna presses on with the extraction mission accompanied by the floating laptop. At this point, the alarm is raised and Joanna has to fight her way through the tower to reach the helipad for extraction. Along the way, we go through blackouts and some Datadyne grunts before being stopped on the stairs to the roof by an executive of Datadyne, Cassandra DeVries. And at this point, I'll just mention as well, being a spy game, we get a bunch of f***ing cool gadgets in this. And when we get these blackouts, night vision goggles. Industrial strength, night vision goggles. Holy Santa Claus sh yeah, very nice touch there. It was something that you don't see often implemented in games, and it was really cool to see them implemented in a game here. I often associate Nintendo consoles with cartoony, fluffy graphics that really didn't appeal to me very much as a kid, and I'm going to go ahead and say now that if I was a Nintendo 64-owning child, Perfect Dark would have absolutely been my sh**. Absolutely. As a Metal Gear fan, as a Siphon Filter fan, I would have loved Perfect Dark for sure. Cassandra tries to get us to give Dr. Carol back, but at this point we're having none of it. We wipe out her bodyguards using our night vision goggles and continue to the roof. Cassandra tries once more on the roof to make us play ball, but we fob her off and escape on a dropship, much to Cassandra's annoyance. Yeah, she was not a happy bunny. And in response to this incursion, Datadyne decides the best course of action is to kidnap Daniel Carrington. 
the leader of Carrington Institute, who they know is the one that sent Joanna in. They take him hostage a couple of days after our mission at his private villa, demanding the return of Dot's Carol in exchange for Carrington's life. Joanna rescues Carrington after fighting her way through his villa, and this is the point where we get a pretty cool weapon, the sniper rifle, which unfortunately doesn't see much use in this game, or didn't for me anyway. It's a great weapon, isn't it? And with the precision aiming, it was probably one of the only times I actually used the precision aiming in the game. Because, personally, I really don't like it, but I did like the added challenge of being able to zoom in and get the headshots and stuff. It was fun. Now, the precision aiming in this game is only reasonable if you've played Nintendo 64 before. And honestly, a lot of that, I feel, is also owing to the shape of the Nintendo 64 controller, making that a lot more manageable. Not quite as easy to use on a modern controller with modern principles let's say. So with our sniper of intel we fight our way through the villa but we're unable to prevent Datadyne from taking back Dr Carol who it turns out had been at the villa with Carrington discussing Datadyne's plans with him. Not everything is clear at this stage but Carrington heard from a couple of guards who thought he was unconscious that there would be a meeting in Chicago to discuss next steps. He tasks us with infiltrating this meeting to discover what's what. He also mentions calling in some help but is rather vague about who this help may be. More on that later. So the location of this conspicuous secret meeting is in the G5 building in Chicago, which is actually a front for Datadyne. We sneak into the building via a car park elevator and spy on the meeting using a remote recording device. Whilst eavesdropping, we learn of the involvement of Trent Easton, who is the head of the NSA. And certainly not at all based on Clint Eastwood. I draw, honestly, I never put that together, Trent Easton. But that is absolutely within the kind of the realms and the humour of Rare Studios, isn't it? Along with Trent Easton is also a mysterious blonde man dressed in white who appears to be the mastermind of the whole operation. Eventually, Easton confirms that the next stage of their secret plan is to usurp the president. Having heard enough, Joanna relays her findings to Carrington, only to be advised that another, more urgent task requires her attention before further action can be taken against Easton. And what could this urgent task be, I hear you ask? Well, the urgent task we are given is to infiltrate Area 51 in Nevada and meet up with an undercover agent posing as a Datadyne grunt. Joanna fights her way through the facility, meeting up with the agent, a man named Jonathan. Jonathan helps us infiltrate the facility's med lab. And upon entering the lab, Joanna finally discovers the help that Carrington was referring to earlier. It turns out that the Carrington Institute is allied with an alien race called the Mayans. Now the Mayans are sort of your very stereotypical looking grey aliens. They actually discovered humans in the year 2000 BC. And uh, at that point, and through various points throughout our history, up until now, they had decided to sort of leave the human race be, and they decided that without their intervention we would be able to progress. Although, as time progresses, they become increasingly more and more concerned around our behaviour. We discover this because our main reason for being at this facility, it turns out, is to rescue a Mayan bodyguard called Elvis, who is currently unconscious on a gurney awaiting an autopsy, despite still being alive. We rescue Elvis and escape the f from the facility with both Elvis and Jonathan in tow. And at this point, I think it's pertinent to bring up our next sort of set of weapons that we get, the Mayan weapons. And these are really, really cool. Basically, all of their weapons kind of look slightly alive. They do, and the way that they reload is very interesting. Some of the guns look like they just chomp down on the energy balls that you feed them. Other ones look like they just kind of absorb it. And it's an interesting effect. I'd be interesting to see how they made that reload animation, because it really does resemble almost like a drop being melded into another body of water. Yeah, and it did on the Nintendo as well. It probably doesn't look as slick as it does on the Xbox, but it did look... And I remember it looking exactly the same. But no, these weapons are really cool. Basically alien sort of beam gun weapons rather than bullet weapons. Uh, slightly more powerful, typically slightly less rate of fire in my experience with these main guns. But uh, didn't really use them all that much, I've got to say, because I used them a lot when I was a kid, so I thought I'd do something different. But shout-outs to the, the Mayan pistol. can't remember what it's called. Is it the Phoenix? I think it's the phoenix that's yes that yeah i think that that is that the one that um oh god what's its secondary fire now i'm trying to think uh explosive rounds i believe yes thanks yeah yeah i think actually i ended up using that for some of the bits in this mission uh instead of the explosives crate that you're given you can just blow the hole in the wall with an explosive weapon instead <laughs> And also, I think that this is probably a good time for me to just praise some of the level design in this game, because it has an impressive amount of shortcuts, little extra side paths, 
different approaches that you can take and a lot of these side missions that you get given on increased difficulties expose a lot of these additional paths as well as introducing new elements in the levels like cctv cameras that weren't there on some of the easier difficulties so they really did a good job here in terms of ramping up the difficulty there and it also really makes me think i know that someone probably wasn't playing this game with the explicit idea of speedrunners but this game is an extremely speedrunner friendly game in terms of all the different routes and secret ways that you can take and little cuts and shortcuts that you can take throughout the game. I think it's really, really cool. Yeah, you'd have to know the map super well, though, because no map and you can get lost incredibly easily, as I found to my cost, even though I've played this game a bunch. <laughs> that fucking snow level. I got lost in the fucking snow level so many times, dude. That's interesting. I found the natural environments easier to navigate. It was the more inside environments where there was a lot of repeated textures in hallways and rooms. It's all the tunnels in the snow level, mate. You know when you're uh, trying to find the president clone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about just getting lost in there. Ugh. Coming nicely for the subject of level design, this is probably a good chance to talk about some of the object physics in this game because Will mentioned there about uh, the exploding crate that we have to use to blow open a hole as part of this mission. If you just run into that, it goes flying. It just goes absolutely flying. It's like it's an ice. Yeah, it's it like resembles one of those air hockey pucks, the way it skids around. Exactly, just bouncing off walls. And you can actually do some quite cool stuff with it. Like you can knock it into the wall and bounce it into enemies. It doesn't hurt them, but gets in their way, stops them from doing stuff for a bit. And you can then shoot them in the face. And if you're holding it to drag it around, you can be walking forwards and then release it and let the momentum of it shoot forward as well. So there's a, there's a lot of fun to be had there if you are impressed by extremely basic <laughs> physics. But at the time, that would have been quite impressive and it's definitely something that I would have probably spent an embarrassingly long amount of time pushing that block around different rooms. Uh, it's like a pallet on a hover device, isn't it? I suppose that's how it gets its ice skatey physics. I would agree with that statement if it wasn't for the fact every single other object does it too, but yeah. Yes, you're right there. Yeah, that is true. There are quite a few objects. Even some of the desks in the game in the earlier levels that you can move by walking into it do it. Although perhaps not to such a high degree, but yeah. Yeah, the two worst are this and the gurney that Elvis is on. Yeah. They're the most slidey boys of them all, but... Crisscross! With our main friend, now safe and sound, Joanna can return to the matter of the President and Dated Iron's plot to usurp him. She poses as an air stewardess to gain access to the airbase where Air Force One is stationed and sneaks on board with little suspicion. With the help of another quality weapon, the crossbow. And I actually quite like this level as well, stealing the disguise. It was more spy shit. And yet again, the game was doing a really good job of avoiding sort of being too shooty in a lot of ways, and it gave you opportunities to sneak around characters. And there's also a handful of scatterings of bits where you're strictly enforced not to raise an alarm as well otherwise the mission will end uh and, and i enjoyed how that played out in here as you're walking around various guards will salute you or say hey your character kind of whispers a hey back as well some of the uh voice acting in this game i think is very intentionally dopey uh there's a lot of characters in the game that just have really weird voices for no reason and i think it's just people having fun with making the game honestly some of the continuity left leaves a lot to be desired but <laughs> yeah. you know for the most part it's funny yeah some of them don't work but so now on board once the plane is airborne easton head of the nsa tries to convince the president to give datadyne access to the pelagic 2 a deep sea government research craft but is refused miffed by the president's refusal to play ball easton sets his thugs loose on the plane however joanna is luckily there to stop them at this point, a mysterious-looking craft latches onto the plane, dropping off yet more Datadyne soldiers to cause havoc. So Joanna secures the plane, saves the president by taking him to an escape pod, and tries to uncouple the mysterious craft from Air Force One with explosives, but is not successful. Thankfully, Elvis is on hand in his UFO-slash-flying saucer to save the day. Sort of. The weapons on his flying saucer malfunction, so he is forced to improvise, ramming his ship into the coupling. Whilst this works to a degree, it also causes all three of the aircraft to crash into the Alaskan wilderness, although thankfully the president managed to launch his escape pod before impact. Waking up in the snow following the crash, Joanna tries to contact the Institute to give a status report. However, communications are being jammed by a nearby ship. She disables the communications jam before heading off into the snow to find the president and our friend Elvis. She stumbles across the mysterious craft that had latched itself on to Air Force One and finds a clone of the president, who it turns out was actually going to be put into power 
as a successor puppet for Easton and his cronies. Joanna takes him out swiftly before locating the real president in some tunnels beneath a snowdrift. Which is where I got lost. With the president in tow, we rendezvous with Elvis next to the wreckage of his flying saucer before being extracted by the Institute. We then get a cutscene of the mysterious blonde man from earlier and Easton talking. The blonde man is not impressed by Easton's failure and reveals his true self, a large, almost dinosaur-looking alien called a Skedar, before killing him dead. The true antagonist of the game finally reveals themselves, the Skedar. And with them, we get our final sort of set of weapons, if you like. And uh, there's only really one weapon of the Skedars that is even worth talking about, in my opinion. You know what it is? Would it be the Mauler? No, it would be the Reaper. The Reaper. Okay, okay. Yes. Why did you like this one so much? Because it's a badass machine gun in primary fire and in secondary fire, grinder! <laughs> you just fucking grind shit. It's great. So for context, the machine gun bit is like, um, almost like a Catherine wheel the firework in terms of what it looks like so it spins round and fires off a bunch of bullets at the same time secondary mode just deactivates the firing of it and you can just push it into people it's <laughs> just wicked. mash them with it i wasn't a big fan of the mauler though the little pistol yeah it's kind of like an smg alien pistol isn't it really that's close as what you can describe it to yeah and it's just not quite powerful enough to be good and not quite quick enough to be useful in my opinion it's a sort of tweener gun so at this stage, having had their scheme revealed, Datadyne and the Skedar steal the Pelagic II and head out to a site in the Pacific Ocean. Joanna and Elvis set out to disrupt the research activity and find out exactly what the Skedar are looking for. After successfully disrupting the research on board the ship, they head down to the deep sea using a submersible and find what the Skedar are looking for, a sentient alien battleship known as a Seatan. According to Carrington, this ship houses a weapon on board capable of destroying things on a molecular level, which in the hands of the Skedar would lead to the destruction of Earth in a matter of moments. So Joanna and Elvis make their way down to the core of the ship, fighting through Skedar and Datadyne troops, eventually finding what remains of Dr. Carroll. They manage to restore their personality, a copy of which had been conveniently kept in a nearby safe, hashtag video games, at which point Dr. Carroll reveals that the only way to destroy the ship and the weapon it houses is for the good doctor to make the ultimate sacrifice. We press F in the chat, leave them behind, and escape the ship returning to the Carrington Institute. I felt like this was meant to be like a touching moment in a weird way, because it's the way he says farewell to you and everything. <laughs> Whatever, laptop! See you later! <laughs> Sometime later, at the Carrington Institute, Joanna and Daniel Carrington are about to leave for a presidential reception at the White House. Mission completed. Cue lots of back patting and celebrations, when suddenly the ground starts to shake and a distress signal is received and gunshots are heard. Those pesky Skedar aren't happy that we destroyed the Seatan ship and have come to the Institute for revenge. Joanna, still dressed in her party attire, it's a lovely little, uh, looks like a little cherry blossom number style dress. So Joanna and her party attire in tow return to the Institute to save the employees and take out the aggressors. During the commotion, the Skedar plant a bomb, so Joanna hauls ass to get it disabled, taking out many Skedar and grunts along the way. Having seen the employees to safety, aboard Carrington's shuttle, Joanna stays behind to take out the remaining enemies. However, she is knocked unconscious by some falling boxes, and is eventually kidnapped by the Skedar. And worth just very briefly mentioning that in this mission we get access to an experimental little gun uh, which isn't too powerful in its own right but its secondary function is it cloaks you and makes you invisible so when joanna wakes up she is in a holding cell on board a skedar assault ship she is not alone however her cellmate is none other than cassandra de vries oof that's awkward but uh in a rather unexpected turn of events cassandra states that she had been used by the skedar and joanna was her only chance of revenge before running out of the cell and sacrificing herself to cause a distraction, allowing Joanna to escape. Okay, I'm glad that you've said that to me and that got confirmed, because that scene, and quite a few of these scenes in this game, seem fairly nonsensical, <laughs> given like the uh, slightly off voice acting, the animations being a little janky sometimes. And again, this is all, i got to say, this is like with a massive caveat that this is all based around the fact this game came out in 2001, I believe. 2000. 
2000 was it so all of that is fine within the context of this game however it did lead to some misinterpretations on my side i initially thought cassandra was hoping that we were going to escape together and then just got accidentally chomped the moment she opened the door i hadn't quite put together that that was her intention was to get chomped right then and there she was just like don't worry me and you are gonna get out of this together you're my only hope of revenge opens the door gets eaten, and you're like see you later <laughs> she doesn't put up any fight at all it's quite pathetic <laughs> no. really <laughs> oh dear so uh, as a result of this we escape and uh, as we're sort of roaming around the ship joanna is contacted by elvis who had followed the skedar vessel in a new flying saucer he asks us to disable the ship's shields so that he can board and assist us joanna being the good spy that she is obliges links up with elvis and assisted by another couple of mayans they capture the skedar ship at this point it looks like the day is won but before celebrations can begin, Elvis points out that the planet they are orbiting is the location of a Skedar holy site, the destruction of which could lead to an era of peace, as the Skedar would lose faith and the will to fight. So, a little bit of lore. Basically, the Mayans and the Skedar have been fighting each other for hundreds of years. And uh, at this point where we are in the game, they're sort of in a very uneasy ceasefire, with basically Elvis in intimating that... The Skedar are sort of only a small sort of push away from starting full-scale war again. So naturally, he is very keen to shut that down in any way possible. And the way he suggests is uh, nipping down to this planet and taking out their holy site. So naturally, we head down to the planet to take out the site to bring peace to the galaxy. Upon landing, Joanna is tasked with marking three obelisks for destruction, taking out the Skedar High Priest before escaping so that the Mayan fleet can bombard the site, destroying it for good. Joanna makes her way down the facility, taking on many cloaked and uncloaked Skedar along the way, before finally reaching the Inner Sanctum for the final showdown with the Big Skedar... What? <laughs> with the Big Skedar? With the Skedar Big Evil. I mean, Big Skedar works too. He's pretty big. So, man, what did you think of this boss fight? Only boss in the game, really? Can't think of anything else that you could even consider boss-like? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. This game is not a boss-type game. I thought that this boss fight was pretty easy. Uh, a lot of the Skedar guns in the game help with any force fields and things like that. This honestly was fine. It wasn't too much of a challenge. Yeah, and you knew exactly what you had to do straight away? Um, I had watched a... Um, a run of this before playing it on the thing before i got to the end of that because i started this on nintendo 64 and then i finished so yeah i didn't have to figure anything out i, I knew what to do sort of thing yeah oh, fair because that took me quite a long time the first time i played this game i was like why am i not <laughs> killing this motherfucker because uh, for context you shoot the big bad and he's got a shield on so you never actually do any damage to him and uh he'll eventually stop and sort of recharge a little bit under this sort of five-pronged spike ornament or statue for lack of a better term the symbol of the skedar i assume and what you have to do is you have to shoot each sort of section of this what would you even call it statuette yeah it's like a giant kind of sp like suspended spire isn't it something there like is that. a word i'm looking for emblem emblem totem? giant skedar emblem <laughs> pointy totem is that what emblem is <laughs> Pointy totem, emblem's like symbol, pointy yeah. totem works too, yeah, and uh, yeah, you have to do that five times, and uh, basically the big boss has a few moves it can use, it has a rocket launcher, which will one-shot you if it hits you, but is incredibly easy to avoid, it can summon other Skedar in, which isn't too big a problem, no, honestly, no. and uh, the other thing it do is it cloaks itself and hides at the back of the room before coming up and kicking you in the face, and again, uh, owing to the age of the game, you can actually see the outline of the cloaked person, so you can avoid it incredibly easily. Yeah, occasionally they blended in better than others, but the majority of the time you can quite clearly see these things. I suppose that does help. Honestly, I wasn't a big fan of the uh, cloaky boys. I like it when I can cloak, don't like it when they can cloak. I would probably have had more of a problem with it if they weren't so bait with the noises they make before they uncloak. That's true. And they are also... The cloaky enemies tend to be the weaker ones as well, which helps. You don't have to deal with them too much. Yeah, thankfully limited interactions with invincible cloaking enemies. But um, no, I agree with you. This boss fight wasn't too difficult. It's got a satisfying end, though. It certainly does. After finally shooting the totem off, you absolutely hot fuzz the boss and just completely impale him uh, by the falling spiky totem. Works a charm. I'm not surprised by this, but you sadly don't get to see impact. No, you don't. The camera cuts away. I think that they wanted to keep it. Uh, they wanted to keep that age rating down. So with the boss now impaled, the fight is over, and 
Without really giving us any time to breathe and sort of celebrate our victory, the Mayans begin bombarding the site. Nice of them to wait for us to get out, really. <laughs> so with the place collapsing around her, Joanna exits stage left so as not to be buried alive. A tense cutscene then follows with Elvis looking for <laughs> Joanna amongst the ruins. Sorry, I just used tense cutscene. <laughs> Just with these weird honking synth noises in the background implying tension. <laughs> yeah, and really awful voice acting, because we haven't said it at this point, but um, Elvis just sounds like a knockoff Yoda. I'm alive! I thought I'd be chopped up like the others by now. You're from the Institute, aren't you? I recognize you from before. You helped me. Thank you. He, he goes in and out as well. It sounds like someone trying to do a Yoda impersonation that keeps on forgetting to do a Yoda impersonation. But no, tense cutscene. Incredibly tense. You could cut the tension with a knife. <laughs> no, I can't even say that, seriously. But during this tense cutscene, Elvis is looking for Joanna amongst the ruins. Uh, as hope seems to be fading, he finally finds her trapped under some debris. The first thing she says is she demands his gun, which is quite an odd request if you ask me, before emptying the clip under the rubble. It turns out that a lone Skedar had grabbed her leg while she tried to escape. That was actually quite a good scene in the game. It's like, give me your hand. No, I need your gun. I'm going to need to get this thing. She's kind of shouting at it, let go of me, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> and then they have a bit of banter afterwards. So Joanna's like, I would have escaped quicker if it wasn't for that thing grabbing me. And Elvis is just like, yeah, sure you would. Sure you would. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But now free from the rubble, Elvis advises Joanna that they didn't have long before the Mayan fleet began their bombardment again. So they escaped together riding off into the sunset and ending our tale. And that is perfect art, my friends. A very sudden ending, i got to say. I wasn't quite expecting credits to roll straight away, and, you know, I was almost expecting to go back to that almost resembling an inauguration, uh, and I was hoping to sort of see the president stick some medals on, see Elvis get a medal and get his true recognition. I thought that he was a very fun character in this game. I thought that he had quite a lot of attitude. He even comments that one of your escape vehicles doesn't have enough style for him. He's definitely kind of a lot of the uh, comedy relief in this game in terms of the way that his character clearly doesn't take the situation too seriously. Despite actually being the bodyguard of one of the main Mayan ambassadors and his, uh, I guess, official title is Protector One. And I think he was one of two or three other protectors. Uh, obviously, being the uh, only remaining survivor after they were shot down by the conspirators. But no, yeah, so um, I don't think I really need to ask this question given what you've said so far, but uh, what did you think? You'd never played this game before. New experience for you. Tell me some of your favourite weapons. Tell me some of your favourite characters. Elvis, by the sounds of it, but was there anyone else that stood out? Uh, in terms of favourite characters, I think Elvis is probably a fan favourite. I think in terms of the mission structure, some of my favourite missions were actually probably quite early on ones. Oh yeah, for sure. In my opinion, the first mission is the best mission in the game, particularly on um, Perfect Agent. Just the additional things you have to do, like you say, knocking out Cassandra to steal her necklace, exploring that sort of... It's almost like the um, Carrington Institute building, but a, li a little bit taller. Yeah, and I just really enjoyed that level. In terms of favourite weapon in the game, an honourable mention to the Psychosis Gun. Uh, it's a fun weapon to have. Scrambles people's brains. Probably one of the more interesting ones in terms of effects, although it doesn't actually have a secondary fire, unlike the rest of the guns in the game. Honestly, my favourite gun in this game, even though it's obviously beaten by some of the later alien weapons, I really like the original human sniper rifle. Mostly for the sound and the look of it, and probably a close second being the dual wield silence pistols. Again, a weapon that you get very early on in the game, but whenever I had the opportunity to use them, I was always jumping back to them, even over things like the Dragon or some of the heavier assault rifles, just because they're so damn fun to use, and they sound awesome. I agree with you about the uh, the dual wield falcons. Don't get them too often, dual wield. A lot of the time you have to do something special in the level to get them, like blow up a hidden explosive barrel or find a special enemy in a room somewhere. There is a bunch of secrets in this game, man. So many secrets hidden in the levels and so much replay value. What about yourself? Do you have a, another favourite gun? Top favourite gun? Oh yeah, it's not even a question for me. My favourite gun in the game is the K7 Avenger. It's not even close. Not even close. Uh, it was my favourite gun back in the day and it's my favourite gun when I played it this time. It's uh, the K7 Avenger is the data dine assault rifle, basically. Yeah, yeah, really powerful. And it's just really, really good. Looks nice, sounds good, shoots good. It's got a great range, it's got a good rate of fire. The magazine size is reasonable, the power output's great. Just a great all-round gun. It's not one of my favourites necessarily, but I'll give an honourable mention to the combat knife. Because it's quite a nice little melee weapon. Yeah. But if you use it secondary mode, you flip it around and it's a poison throwing knife. 
just very really nice good. touch in terms of favorite level we've sort of covered already i think the first level of the game is the best level and my favorite character is joanna dark i just i love the sass i love the the sort of snide remarks she makes like particularly her interaction with jonathan when you have when you have that sort of meeting and they're just taking the piss out of each other i just think that's really fun it's like maybe if you didn't kill so many people we wouldn't be in this mess ah shut up <laughs> it's just good good fun he's trying to encourage you as well to sort of sneak through the area and uh, unlike your usual self maybe you should try sneaking through this one yeah so naturally the first thing i did was kill everyone <laughs> when i went through i was just like nah mate not listening to you he also really feels the need to reiterate the fact that the explosive box that you're currently carrying really doesn't like being shot yeah but then it takes like 10 shots to explode <laughs> yeah. so, so this guy knows nothing about what he's talking about an interesting thing that you say about joanna's character that her being uh, your favorite one so i believe that she was actually just an employee of the rare office uh you know not like a hired in voice actor or anything like that and she does a very good job i think in comparison of bringing the character to life considering that i don't think she previously had a career in uh in voice acting i know nothing of that so i'll have to take your word for it but that is very cool if that's the case because she fucking nails it in my <laughs> just, opinion just hire your receptionist <laughs> But no, I, I had a lot of fun with this. It was um, a nice nostalgia trip for me because I obviously haven't thought about this game for about 20 years. Really, really nice little trip down memory lane. So um, just before we close off on final thoughts about the game, there were a couple bits of the game that I thought were really interesting. Some really nice, noticeable attentions to detail that I really appreciated. I think number one for a game that came out in 2000, the reactions that the guards have to getting shot as well as the blood spatters that appear behind them when you shoot them, I thought were really, really impressive for a game of that generation. It's something that often gets overlooked. Because when you shoot someone, you can shoot them in the leg and they'll go down to grab their knee, and then you can shoot them in the chest and they'll stand back up, and then you can shoot them in the other shoulder and they'll hold that shoulder. So as you're shooting these characters, they switch between various different getting injured animations, which really makes you feel like each bullet has its own impact and reaction. Because of all of that, it makes it a very fun game to shoot people. I'd agree with that. The shooting in this game's class. I will admit that the animations and the way that they uh, take bullets sometimes feels very out of place, but again, I feel like that's a criticism valid of a modern game. However, something like this is absolutely possible and just adds to the impressiveness, really. I would rather them take a little longer to hit the floor just so I can put a few more bullets in them as they go down because it looks so damn good. Also, this game had lighting in it, which I wasn't expecting to see. Obviously, it's a, it's a kind of a, a very certain kind of lighting in the game, kind of emulated lighting in a way. But I thought it was quite impressive that different areas would have varying brightness as you approach different lights. The fact you could also shoot out lights to make the area darker. I don't know whether that had any impact on whether the enemies saw you or not, but it was certainly implied in the game that <laughs> that, that did. Uh, maybe that was just me sort of immersing myself a little too far in the game, but I thought that was very fun as well. I was going to say, you can combine it with crouching and moving and you basically have sneak mode. This game does a really good job of actually being a spy game. And it's really nice to see that it doesn't just chuck all that out the window in the second half and suddenly become nothing but an all-out shootout game. That may be true for like the last level or two, but there are plenty opportunities in this game to be sneaking, to be doing things more covertly and to go not all guns blazing which I really appreciated as well, yet again adding to more replay value. I also really liked some of the smaller attentions to detail in this game, like the fact that if you keep your button on the fire trigger, when you get to the end of your round, it doesn't just immediately trigger the reload animation. Joanna will keep firing the trigger, even though there's no bullets left in it, which again is just a very small thing, but it's very cool to see, especially when you're firing some of those pistols dual wield, and then you kind of keep clicking for a minute before realizing that you have to reload. I thought that was a nice touch. Also, I noticed that certain pistols in the game actually get held with a side grip when you're shooting people that are very close to you. Again, another weird attention to detail there that I thought was very impressive for a game of its time, that your pistol grip changes depending on how close the target is. And I also really liked kind of going back to the enemy reactions. You could also do things like shoot the guns out of enemies' hands. And something that we praised 13 for when we did some of our coverage of that is that enemies will actually go and retrieve guns on the ground as well, which I thought was, once again, really, really cool. Yeah, and they'll pick up different guns if you've taken their gun. Yeah, exactly that. It's really cool stuff. Well, the other thing that's quite neat talking about that sort of attention to detail is that sometimes the enemy's guns will malfunction as well and you'll hear them say, oh God, what the hell, this gun? Really? So I had heard that dialogue clip? Yeah. It's them shooting and it not working for whatever reason. Do you know, I had another bit in the game where an enemy literally emptied the clip without any breaks in firing. And then he said, how the hell did I miss? And I was wondering if that was another kind of behavioral thing put into the game. 
it does make me think that that could absolutely be a thing because I was also playing around in some of the uh, sort of multiplayer modes, mucking around with some of the AI in the game. And there are various AI with all sorts of different personalities. You can have like a coward character. Uh, you can have a highly aggressive character. And I guess they just tinker with the values of the AI so that they all behave slightly differently. Again, really cool stuff. And one of the uh, the last things I'll say about this game is I really appreciated the agency that the game gave you to fail these missions. Throughout the mission, you can constantly do things that disrupt your main objective or prevent you from doing some of your side objectives. But the game doesn't stop. The game doesn't say, mission failed, time to retry. You can actually carry on for the rest of the mission as far as the game will allow you to get. Obviously, that often is sometimes limited by the fact that one of your side missions is to get a security card or not trigger an alert to prevent a door from sealing. But the game will actually just let you run around the remainder of the level that's available to you, shoot the rest of the guards, and potentially even do some forward ahead scouting for your next attempt. And I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the fact that the game lets you fail and gives you the option to continue going. And it also means that you can have a bit of fun as well. Hey, you want to go in and uh, shoot Cassandra for her necklace? Yeah, sure. The game's going to be pissed at you, but it's funny. Paradox break, but yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've all done it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the game won't let you actually complete the mission, but it will let you uh, play around in the rest of your paradoxical existence. Yeah. The other thing that's quite cool is, uh, and it's very hard to do this, but you can do it. You can actually do the objectives out of order. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did that a couple of times, actually. So like, you can you can complete objective three before you've done one and two sometimes, and objective three tip typically is like where the cutscene and all them be so you do have some interesting things where you complete objective two after objective three and then you get teleported back to where objective three would be for the cutscene oh okay i hadn't noticed any of that but i think most of the cutscene objectives i did at the intended time so the one that instantly sticks out to my mind from this run was where you had the clone president i saved the real president and found elvis before i did that so i shut down the jamming signal got the real president and then was like, right, let's go find the clone. <laughs> Eventually found the clone and then got teleported back to the um, to the flying saucer. Nice quality of life thing. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows with this game. There are some issues. I'm not going to lie to you. This is probably me like being very nitpicky with this because these issues can pretty much be put down to it's a game from the year 2000. But um, sometimes enemies um, will just fire at nothing. And will completely, like, you know, you're talking about missing the target. Oh, yeah. I'm talking completely missing target. So the mission where you have to save hostages in the Carrington Institute, I actually walked into one of the rooms upstairs and saw the guy pointing at the hostage, turn to the side to point at the wall and empty his clip on the wall. Not not ideal, but it is what it is. Um, the voice acting, which we've spoken about, some of it just doesn't work. It's quite funny. It's cheesy. It's, it's corny. Charming. It's a video game from the 2000s. <laughs> exactly. I grew up with Resident Evil 1. I'm well versed in the world of oh, dodgy gosh. voice acting. Yeah. <laughs> a suggestion for improvement in this game would have been that after the cutscene in the middle of levels that we get a checkpoint. I know checkpoints were a very rare thing at this time in gaming. We've actually played some much more modern games like 13, where we criticise that for not having enough checkpoints in it. Uh, so again, that is a very minor point. It is perhaps something that they could have implemented for the remastered version on the Rare Replay. Uh, but it's it's really minor. Often the levels are very short, and I think once you get to know them, you can complete them all in roughly five minutes or less. Oh yeah, I, I was like all in five hours. Yeah, like a lot of these in. levels are very short if you know what you're doing. And that was with, like, starting some missions again, because I failed a few or whatever. Yeah, you occasionally... You'll do... Sometimes this game has weird things, like there's a button on the wall, and it doesn't tell you that that's the alarm, and if you press it, the game's over. <laughs> yeah. But you do do it, and, you know, that can be quite frustrating. So some of the signposting can be less than ideal. Again, it's all just stuff that they didn't really do in the games of that time. My only legitimate criticism of this game where actually they could have done a better job, and I'll be really interested in if you agree. I thought the music sucked. I thought the soundtrack for this game was bullshit. When you think about, like, Metal Gear Solid, a game of a similar genre, the quality of the soundtrack on Metal Gear Solid with these orchestral noises compared to just synth noises and various kind of muted beats, the instruments that they used for the tracks I didn't like, but I also found the music to be very boring, very repetitive, very bland, and lacked any attitude. Uh, I completely disagree. <laughs> completely disagree but how much of that is my nostalgia i don't know 
but I completely disagree. I thought they were all bangers. <laughs> all bangers, really? Every single one, yeah, in their own way. And you get the, some of the songs switch up and get like a faster tempo when there's like a timed section going on. I, I think you're being a bit harsh, but it's, it's your opinion. I guess I'm comparing it to like perfect examples that are particularly memorable to me, like Metal Gear Solid, where they actually had big budget soundtracks. And I think that this is much more of a sign of all of this music was made in-house. Sort of thing. I think that at least is is quite obvious, sort of thing. And it definitely has that spy feel. It conveys the right thing. I just didn't find any of it particularly inspired to my ears, anyway. No, that's fair enough. But yeah, I mean, I guess that pretty much closes off my thoughts on the game. Overall, really enjoyable, very impressive for its time. Did a lot of things I didn't expect, and actually completely surprised me in terms of how much I enjoyed it. And I really do stand behind those words, that if I was a Nintendo 64 kid, I would have been a Perfect Dark kid rather than a Metal Gear Solid kid, I reckon. Probably the only spy game I truly like, so... Yeah, fair play to it. Probably because it doesn't force you to be that much of a spy. It's like, you can either be a spy, or you can just be very quick at killing everyone. (laughs) That was me. I was that one. But no, I agree. Excellent game. So with that, we come to the end of another week of Completionist Corner, another good game done and dusted, and it's now the end of the episode. So thank you very much for listening, if you've got the spa. If you've enjoyed what you listen to, you can, as always, find the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts by searching for Total Pod Mode. We also post regular video content of our playthroughs, stream highlights, as well as the podcast, on our YouTube channel, Total Pod Mode. You can also find us on Twitter by searching for at Total Pod Mode, all one word. Or you can find me at Hoodafunk on Twitter, and I'm also on Twitch under twitch.tv forward slash Hoodafunk. And you can find me on Twitter at Mr. Bames, and I'm also on Twitch under twitch.tv forward slash Mr. Bames underscore TPM. And with those socials out of the way, please do go check them out. Give us a like, comment. Drop those five stars. Yeah, five star rating. Why not? You know we're worth it. Come on, guys. Yeah, don't be coming out with no four star ratings. Yeah, five star only. We'll, we'll know who you are. We will do. We have we IP trackers. You. We know your location. Exactly. And Elvis is currently watching your house. So I see you, Daniel in Bracknell. I see you, Adam in Teddington. But with that, we come to the end of the show. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Oh, 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 oh